honorable member for Hamilton East Stony Creek. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this particular motion here today. Uh, as members of Parliament, I believe the single most important duty we have is to give consideration to actions by the government as those actions, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Speaker, those actions that will lead our military men and women into harm's way. And one of the things I want to be clear on right here is at this point in time, there is already an action underway to go after ISIL, to go after the people with the atrocities that the members on the other side just spoke about. There's nobody on this side of the House who's any less offended or troubled by those actions. There's nobody on this side. You, you can speak to them in whatever form you want. Right now, militarily, you have about 60 countries involved in a coalition, and not all of those countries have made the decision to put their military into action. The United States, France, and Australia are leading the way with a massive force. And in point of fact, if we consider the number of aircraft that is being proposed by this government, of six aircraft, and the 600 people that will accompany it, that is a very, very small portion of what will be utilized in these bombings. And I would suggest that, based on some testimony that we had at the Subcommittee on International Human Rights this week from uh, a Reverend Majed El Shafi of One World International, which is a group that took a Conservative and some other members of Parliament to Iraq, who took them right to the edge of where the combat is taking place, and they were asked by the President of Iraq and Kurdish leaders, in fact, Mr. Speaker, they were begged by them, not for bombs, but for humanitarian aid for the thousands, the hundreds of thousands of displaced persons in that country. Now, I want to take you back for a moment because do you remember the use of the words collateral damage? In and around Parliament and places of government, we often have what we call buzzwords. An example of buzzwords that I'm very familiar with was free trade. In the 80s, there was a great debate on free trade, and it sounded good. In the war, the Gulf Wars, the two of them, when the American missiles and bombs were dropping, they referred to collateral damage. The collateral damage, Mr. Speaker, are men women and children. There is nobody that can direct a surgical strike that doesn't put at risk of having collateral damage. One of the offshoots of the Gulf War was the instability when the Americans left. And prior to that time, Saddam Hussein, who was a Sunni, whose tribe was smaller, about one-third or one-quarter the size of the Shia in the area of the world. And he installed his supporters, Sunnis, into the army. And when the Americans and their allies removed Saddam Hussein and destabilized that area, he was replaced ultimately by a prime minister who was Shia, who sought revenge for some of the many atrocities committed by the troops of Saddam Hussein, and it's said that he didn't pay the army on time, but he humiliated them. And so when a few thousand, a couple of thousand of ISIL fighters came across the border, five divisions, five divisions of Iraqi soldiers laid down their arms. Many of them joined ISIL. And they did that because of that instability, because they believed not understanding the horrific consequences, they believe by joining ISIL, they would get a fairer deal from the government. Now, since that time, Mr. Speaker, that particular prime minister has been removed. But what has happened, um, I'm being reminded here, thank you very much, I'm splitting my time with the member from Louis Hebert. I appreciate that. I need all the help I can get. I'm suffering through a cold. Anyway, coming back to the situation, the instability that was created by that vacuum and the years and years of Shia, Sunni, tribal warfare is what you're seeing being taken advantage of by the ISIL group. 
And we've heard testimony from people here today and other days of the fact that ISIL is far more sophisticated than any terrorist group that we've come across. They're an offshoot that came from Al-Qaeda. So our leader was indicating in this house the other day that, that the North Americans have been fighting ISIL in one form or another for well over 10 years. So they took advantage of that vacuum and they've also taken advantage of some people who had they really considered their actions would not have joined them. And it is horrific. We've heard very little like it. The only place I can think of that might be comparable is the Democratic Republic of Congo where they've had atrocities there. Now Reverend Al Shafi who spoke to us in committee and raised the fact that they're four to five weeks away from winter and there's not even shelter for people. The few hundreds of millions of dollars, if not a billion dollars, that's going to be spent by Canada in these bombing missions would be better served to the people on the ground who are suffering in that country if we were to go there and build shelters and bring medicines and bring winter clothes and bring the things that they need. They were forced out of their homes. They didn't... Uh, they were given a choice, really. If they were not believers in this particular brand, this abhorrent brand of Islam, was when I'm pleased to hear the government say that it is not Islam as the world knows it. This is a group of people much like Osama bin Laden who uses the word jihad to justify horrific things. Those who know a little bit about Islam, jihad simply means to defend your religion when it becomes under attack, not to go out and do the things that are happening here. It's very important, I think, Mr. Speaker, to remind Canadians who might be watching that in Canada, there's 1.2 million Muslims. And I, every once in a while, will find somebody that's ill-informed and say the Muslims are trying to take over or this and that, and I remind them there's 32 million rest of us. But when, Mr. Speaker, do you see in a newspaper in Canada of a Muslim attacking somebody? or stealing, robbing a bank, committing murder. You ex it's extremely rare because these are good people who believe very fundamentally and committed to Islam. But again, this is not Islam. This is a terrible group of, well, you can't think of them in any other terms than monsters because it's monstrous the things that they've been doing. And I can understand members on the other side who have the lever of power who have the ability to say we should put aircraft in the air or put troops on the ground, and in fairness, they haven't said that as yet, but we're worried about it might happen. I can understand when you're facing those kinds of horrific crimes that you would want to do something. Well, we have a coalition of 60 nations. We have amongst them the top three or four militaries on the face of the earth prepared to undertake this mission. They do not need Canada to go there bombing, but they do need Canada's help in this effort. And I agree with Canada taking part in this effort. I agree that Canada must do something on a huge humanitarian scale, because this is going to be proven to be one of the most horrific times in our history with what is going to happen to the displaced persons They've already been terrorized to the point of having to leave their home. Many have had brothers and fathers and uncles and cousins murdered and the other atrocities that we've heard about. Nobody is arguing that those have not happened. What we are arguing, Mr. Speaker, that perhaps, perhaps Canada can take that step back from going to military action and say, we are prepared to stand up with our allies, supply the humanitarian air, the support, the delivery of arms, which we've already been doing, which we're also in agreement with, to those fighters trying to protect their homelands. But it's most important to take that pause before we choose to send our men, women, into a war zone that is going to become a quagmire. We saw it happen in the last war in Iraq. We saw it happen in Afghanistan, where 40,000 Canadians went through that war zone. And we're still paying the price for that today, Mr. Speaker, with PTSD and the loss of over 150 Canadian soldiers and a, and a person from our diplomatic service. So I'll close, Mr. Speaker, by appealing to the government side. Take a moment. Step back. 
give some thought to the fact that this is a broader, a broader concern than just war and bombing. It's a place where we can do some real human humanitarian work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Minister of State for the Southern Economic uh, Development Agency. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just say to my honoured co colleague that we don't have a moment. We don't have all the time in the world. I wish we did. I wish we didn't have to go. I wonder why it is that the NDP, who made their decision to vote against this motion long before the motion even was put up, that we have not seen a change in that position, despite everything that we've said. We don't see democracy here or rational debate. We see obstinance and obstruction. The member knows full well that we have humanitarian aid over there and we can do more and we will. The opposition is concerned about refugees. We are. We're doing a lot in that regard. We'll do more. But what do we do as a nation that can about those people who cannot escape the evil? Do we just focus on those that can escape the evil and become refugees and leave those that cannot escape to this evil to only die, to be tortured, to be buried alive? I say we don't do that. And with a heavy heart, I will vote for this motion. I'm asking that reasonable member to break rank, to break the domination of his leader and vote for this motion. Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Mr. Speaker, I was proud to stand in this House and vote against the Afghanistan mission because I thought it was ill-conceived and ill-prepared Ill for. Looking upon the circumstances we have today, and the member says, if we don't go to war, those people will die. There happens to be a huge military force of France, the United States, and Australia with the weapons that can do exactly the job they are asking Canadian military to do. And we're saying, Mr. Speaker, it's not necessary for us to take part in that level of that conflict, but to, for Canada to have a role supplying humanitarian aid, supplying the workers that will build shelters. And that's where Canada and a huge number of Canadians believe we should be on this particular event. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I frankly do share the hesitancy of the Honourable Member, and I congratulate him on his uh, speech, and um, <clears throat> I do wish we could ramp down the politics of this, uh, this matters, because uh, <clears throat> not one of us on either side uh, wishes to send uh, men and women in our military in harm's way, um, particularly in a situation such as this kind. I wonder if the Honourable Member has given thoughts to uh, the people uh, that are going to be joining us in the coalition, not, this, not so much the obvious ones, rather uh, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. Um, up until now, S Iran has been the greatest exporter of um, uh, state-sponsored terrorism, uh, according to our own Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, they are sponsors of Hezbollah. Yet in this particular fight, they are our allies. Um, that puts everybody in a very awkward position. So I'd be interested in his thoughts. For Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Mr. Speaker, the member will be probably surprised to know that prior to speaking, I came in in a rush because I just left a press conference where we were talking about dissidents in Iranian prisons about to be executed. So I share his concern, and we, we've heard the comments about uh, if Syria asks, if Assad asks, we'll bomb. And this was a man that just a, a year and a half or so ago, the United States drew a red line and said if he crossed it, they would, uh, would stop him, and they, and they failed to do that. And all of a sudden, this man is a potential ally. We certainly all should feel conflicted in this place, and I don't care what party. You know, there's good souls who sit here are going to make the best judgments they can with the information they have at hand. We've lost an opportunity in this House. I uh, don't often agree with, with some of my friends, but the fact that we could have had our leader and the leader of the third party sworn into the Privy Council and taken into the discussions. Maybe it's possible it might have looked different, but we can only make our decisions based on the information placed before us and placed before our leaders, and they failed on that count, Mr. Speaker.